if there's one perception, it's Latter-day Saints are discouraged from critical thinking. Is that true as a professor at BYU? Absolutely not. Hello, and welcome to the Hello Saints podcast. My name is Jeff. I am a pastor living in Utah, exploring everything I can about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I am joined for the very first time on this channel, which I'm really excited about, with a BYU professor. This is Stefan Tager. Hey, how's it going, Jeff? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I tried to call him Dr. Tager, but he wouldn't let me, so... We're <laughs> Stefan's just gonna, great. Yeah. Stefan's, <laughs> Stefan's great. So this is a very frequent request that people make, is that can you please sit down with a religion professor from BYU? And a mutual friend of ours, Kyle... Bashirs. Bashirs, yeah. he introduced us uh, just about a month ago. Yeah. We had lunch, had a great conversation right there at BYU. And uh, yeah, I've just been saying, you know what? That was such a good conversation that a few passerbyers saw while we were, you know, eating our rice bowl. Like, we need to get this conversation online and just show people what a dialogue can look like between two individuals from very different backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about your background. Where are you from? What did you did you at five years old just wake up one day and say, I want to be a professor at BYU? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I was born and raised in Massachusetts and. I served a mission in Las Vegas, went to school. And after my mission in Las Vegas, I decided I wanted to be a seminary teacher. And I'm not sure how much you're aware of how sort of that works, but in Utah, Wasatch Front area, um, there are buildings that are set up next to the high schools. And students will actually get a release time period where they're released away from the high school to go take seminary classes. And so I taught those seminary classes for many years, just the high school students. And then I decided I wanted to do graduate work and BYU has this a program where you can go and do graduate work if you're a seminary teacher and you can also teach religion classes. Hmm. And while I was working on my PhD there, I also was teaching religion classes and just fell in love with the environment, the mission, the the purpose of BYU, what it stands for. And then uh, after, you know, working on my CV, publishing and and adjuncting for a few years, I, I got hired just, just uh, about a year and a half ago. So, That's awesome. Yeah. So you were born into the church? Uh, I was absolutely born and raised. Yeah. Okay. You were born into it. Yeah. Was there a point, even as you were like going through seminary yourself, that you had to kind of own your faith and what you believe? I'm yeah. curious to know how that works because anybody that serves vocationally in ministry, specific in any religion, but even in my context, there's usually sort of this point where they were either born into it, and if they were born into it, they have to kind of make it their own. Right. And I know that in some maybe historic denominations like Lutheranism and stuff like that, you you go through a confirmation process. You're baptized very young, but there's still a moment later on where it's like the lights kind of came on. I'm like, yes, I own this. This is me. This is what I believe. Right. Was there a moment like that for you? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if, if you look back, pretty early sermons from Joseph Smith, he encourages people who are listening to him to study and to pray and to seek for a witness for themselves. So that kind of um, language is used a lot, uh, especially with teenagers, to study, to, to pray, to seek a witness. And so in my teenage years, uh, I remember particularly talking to my father about the Book of Mormon, its historicity, and trying to explore, do I actually think that this is true? I think this is real. And um, I, I had a moment where I, I uh, really felt for me that God was speaking in my heart and saying, this is true. This is the word of God. This is something that you need to do and embrace. And mm -hmm. so I think as I came in, into as a freshman in college, my faith was deepened and my understanding of, of God and his son also grew. And, and a lot of that happened in preparation for a mission. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's definitely uh, in Latter-day Saint discourse, the, an, an encouragement to seek and study and, and try to seek God's will for yourself in relationship to the truthfulness of the church. Right. Yeah. So, when you become a professor at BYU, how long has it been? It's been a few years, right? Yeah. So I adjunct it for a while and I was teaching there while I was doing graduate work, but yeah. officially it's been, this is my second year I'm in, I'm in the middle of. Okay. And teaching at BYU, is it is it somewhat of a dream come true? Because it's a, it's a highly desirable institution to attend if you're a Latter-day Saint. Yeah. Yeah. I actually didn't go there as an undergrad uh -huh. and I didn't know if I wanted to teach there until I started teaching there. Okay. Once I started teaching there, I, I really was looking forward to it. And okay. And uh, I mean, at first, my goal was to kind of be involved in the academy. Yeah. And I'm a Latter Day Saint, and those two things come together very well at BYU. I can I can be a practicing Latter Day Saint and be open about my faith in classes as I teach religion, and also I can 
yeah. uh, do work in the academy as well. So, so what is your specialty yeah. as far as what you teach? Yeah, so I teach Book of Mormon and New Testament. Those are the classes that mostly I, I teach those topics. I do a little bit of Old Testament and a class that's sort of largely a survey of the Bible, uh-huh. but a lot of New Testament and Book of Mormon. Okay, so that's fascinating for yeah. me because evangelicals, I mean, we leave... We lean heavily on the New Testament. We actually lean equally as heavily on the Old Testament. We just probably don't talk about it as much. We believe that they are hand-in-glove revelations of the Lord. Um, But you also teach the Book of Mormon, which, again, from my standpoint, that's not something that we embrace. So I'm curious to know, how do you communicate the relationship, first of all, between the New Testament and the Book of Mormon uh, to these students who I'm sure many of them have gone through seminary, they've probably served on missions. So how do you articulate that from an academic standpoint of the relationship between the New Testament and the Book of Mormon. Yeah, interestingly enough, in 2 Nephi 3, it prophesies how the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah, the stick of Judah for us is the Bible, the stick of Joseph would be the Book of Mormon, will grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines. And so the way we talk about it is they work together to witness of Jesus Christ right, mm-hmm. and to build faith in him. Sometimes certain doctrines are taught clear in certain areas, and so you use scripture as a whole understand fully who God is and his revelation to mankind. Yeah. One thing that's easy to observe in a lot of Christian schools, Christian universities, because I went to one uh, in Greenville, Illinois, and there are just hundreds of them out there, is depending on what denomination that they're a part of, within the school, there's usually sort of a a tension that exists. uh, Some people might feel uncomfortable with this tension. I think it's a healthy tension of... Individuals, teachers, professors who might adhere a little bit more closely to an orthodox view of that denomination's distinctives or teachings or maybe even traditional approaches to hermeneutics or, yeah, yeah. you know, bibliology or whatever it is. But then there's another group, oftentimes, that might be willing to kind of push the envelope a little bit, to maybe think a little bit more outside the box, to push against sort of more orthodox ways of thinking. Is that something that exists at BYU as far as that tension? And again, that's not a bad thing. I think that it's yeah. actually a normal thing in a in an evangelical institution. I'm curious to know if something like that kind of exists at BYU. The way that we would talk about that is sort of a tension between um, exploring and learning and going deeper with within scripture and theology but then also, uh, I think people are, you know, trying to think and explore, but also stay within the bounds of what Latter-day Saints would consider orthodoxy. So sure. at a place like BYU, the expectation is, is that someone will be aligned with the teachings of the church. They'll, they'll be aligned with the basic tenets of the church. And of course, there's there's room to think through difficult issues and say, how do we make sense of this? Or, um, But there's a certain expectation of, hey, we're all on the same page. We're unified. Yeah theologically around really central key points. Which is especially important, I have to imagine, in a Latter-day Saint context. Sure. Because as we were just talking before we started recording, um, Christian colleges in America are always sort of dealing with, regardless of what the internal tensions might, might exist with certain beliefs or even views on social issues, you also have the world we'll even say people who are like unbelieving who would look at a religious institution and be like, what are they doing? Like they're believing in a God. Are you serious? Like this is an age of science and reason. Like what, what are they doing here? And when it comes to a Latter-day Saint context, you're going to BYU, I'm sure deals with that as well sure. because you're a religious institution, yeah. but you have that extra layer of the rest of Christendom also looking at what is taught within a Latter-day Saint context. And you have to contend with that as well. How do you, contextualize that tension or th- those views? Because if I were in your position, I would think that it might seem sort of isolating or like you're on this island. How do you maneuver through that type of existence? Yeah, yeah. What's interesting about that tension, I think, is I think a lot of Latter-day Saints would be appreciated as being seen as Christians, not for some sense of approval from the broader public, but we deeply love Jesus and we have faith in him. Mm-hmm. And it means a lot to us. I mean, he's the center of our faith. That's not even, you know, to say it the most accurately, he's the center of our, God and his son are the center of everything for us. Yeah. And so I think naturally we, will want, we, we would want to be seen as Christian. But also on, the, on another level, I think we're perfectly okay with the idea that there are going to be some places where we deviate. Sure. There's going to be some things that 
people are just going to disagree with, and we're ready to own that. Yeah. We're ready to say, this is who we are and this is what we believe. I mean, as you, know? you should, because if it's the restored church, it's the restored church, right? Right, right. right. So, and, and that's, it's interesting to hear you kind of process through that because it checks out with even your everyday Latter-day Saint in the yeah. pew who will quite frequently say like, we have no problem looking into the rest of Christendom for whatever it is that we might need, whether it be clarification on certain historic teachings or traditions or even styles of worship. Like we're, we're pretty comfortable doing that. And I don't know if that's a newer thing or not, but I know that it's, it's common, it's more common now at least in Latter-day Saints I talk to. Where there's pain is when Christ, the rest of Christendom is looking at them saying, no, you're not part of us, you can't play. Yeah. And it, it sounds something very similar in an academic sense where you're willing and, and you find great edification reaching out into the rest of Christendom for certain perspective or, or thoughts on certain issues yeah. or academic conversation, but it doesn't always come in the opposite direction. Yeah, and, and what's interesting, in most academic spaces, one's faith tradition doesn't play a huge role. If you have good arguments, you have good arguments, Great right? point. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and, and as a Latter-day Saint, I don't think I've experienced much negativity uh, because I'm a Latter-day Saint in the academic realm, mm -hmm. you know? For example, I recently just published, and my research is in homiletics, which is preaching, mm -hmm. and I just published an article on preaching in a traditional Christian journal, you know, it's called homiletic, and no one once asked me about, you know, my tradition or anything like that, yeah. you know? And so I think for the most part, most academics would say, hey, if you bring good arguments, you bring good arguments, yeah. you yeah. know? Yeah, that, so, that makes complete sense. Yeah. And, and even where there might be a certain tension in the academic world, technically, that's the whole point of academics. Right. We press into the tensions. We try to really figure out, you know, what can we verify? What can we agree on? What can we observe here? And if you're contributing to that conversation, regardless of your faith background, you can play, right? Right, right. So I, I think that's that's great. And it also, I it, it speaks to your willingness to say, it's okay for us to press out a little bit and for us to maybe even sit with the tension of people who don't agree like us. I think a lot of Latter-day Saints are actually pretty good at that because it being a smaller sect of Christianity, um, even, especially outside of Utah, you're always going to have to sort of deal with that and maneuver through that. Right. And that's one thing that I appreciated about our conversation is you actually f enjoy interfaith conversation. You don't just, you're not willing to tolerate it. You actually look for it. Yeah, yeah. And tell me a little bit about some of the work that you've done in the interfaith realm and and what you have gleaned from that. Yeah, it sort of happened by accident, really. I spent a lot of time, because my research is in preaching, you know, I've spent my whole life listening to Latter-day Saint sermons, but I also spent a lot of time studying and, and listening or reading sermons from other faith traditions. So I've just always kind of naturally appreciated that. And I'm deeply fed by people mm -hmm. like Tim Keller, or one of my favorite preachers is Fred Craddock, you know, mm -hmm. and, and some of these people who have just been a huge blessing in my life. And so I think sort of that kind of gave me the language a little bit to know how to converse with a traditional Christian, mm. maybe. And then um, I became friends with Kyle Bashirs, who's a mutual friend uh, between us. And he's been bringing students to my house from Alabama, you know, once a year in March, they, they bring students over and I gather, you know, Latter-day Saint students and and uh, we dialogue. We just talk faith and and uh, places we have in common. We talk about, we get clear on differences, right? Mm -hmm. And But it's framed around the, the second great commandment to love our neighbor as ourself. It's no stealth, you know, missionary work, evangelism, nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. We're really trying to create understanding. I think one of the benefits of interfaith dialogue is it, it really invites the people who are involved to get clear about their own mm. tradition. So if I say, uh, we believe that God is one, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a Book of Mormon idea, mm -hmm. right? There's one God. I mean something very different than what obviously you're going to say, right? Yeah, right. About that. And so it, it, it invites us to think deeper about our beliefs and to really get clarity on one's own theology and to have better understanding for another, another yeah. Uh, denominations theology. Yeah, it's interesting you mention that because pastoring for 15 years, I actually would teach a class on Sunday mornings in our time that was called Biblical Education in Sunday School. But it was an adult elective, and it would be a, I would teach a two-year systematic theology course where I was taking you know lay people from the body through a two-year systematic theology. And we're talking about what do we believe and why we believe it in any category of belief. What does the Bible teach about truth about the Bible, about the attributes of God, the, the Trinity, 
you know, Jesus and his mission, the Holy Spirit, the church, the ordinances in times. And we would spend just a ton of time doing that. And on one hand, it's, it's enlightening and it's informative. But in addition to that, I would also encourage at certain points people within the body to go on to apologetics websites of other faiths who are arguing against Christianity, like a Muslim site or something like that, and to consume as much as they can until they feel like they can't take it anymore. Because there is something important about understanding how people view things differently and where they might even disagree with you. I I agree with you that that actually invites a bit of a crisis that at the end of the day can actually be helpful. Now, I think it needs to be done within a careful environment because yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't just want to deconstruct somebody and leave them there. Right, of course, right. But at the same time, I think it's so critically important. I mean, that's, that's what working out is. You're, you're dealing with a resistance to the point that the muscle tears a little bit right. so that when it grows back, it's that much stronger. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the way I look at it is if students are engaging in interfaith dialogue, it's, it's good first and foremost to train them and to talk about the principles about how to do that as a Christian. To not be contentious, to not argue, to seek true understanding, to show love. About the, it's about the posture. Right, yeah. right. It's, it's, it's the disposition and the way we do that. But then also to do it in a, in a, a faith, uh, in faithful environment uh, allows us to talk through it and think through it. I mean, my students are going to leave Provo and going to go talk with people of other traditions, right, their mm-hmm. whole lives. Yeah. And so why not learn how to do that in a way that builds faith and helps them clarify their own beliefs and, and go deeper into their own tradition? Yeah. Right? So you actually get to live in that tension with the classes you teach because you were telling me, not only are you teaching New Testament and Book of Mormon to a primarily Latter-day Saint enrollment, not everybody in BYU is a Latter-day Saint. There are a lot of individuals, many of them athletes, I think is pretty well known, who are non-Latter-day Saint. You also teach classes, the Book of Mormon class, to a non-Latter-day Saint student group, right? What is it like teaching that class? There's not a lot of non-Latter-day Saint students on campus, and so there's not a ton of opportunities to teach this class. And, mm-hmm. and so I'm so thankful that I get to do it. I yeah. get to teach the non-Latter-day Saint class. And the first thing I would say is I'm incredibly impre- impressed and grateful for the way that the students who come to BYU and take... I mean, I'm teaching them Book of Mormon, right? Mm-hmm. And they just handle it with such grace and kindness and I tell them, you know, I'm not trying to convert you. That's not what the purpose of this particular course is. With my other students, I'm absolutely trying to build faith, mm-hmm. right, in in the Son of God and in the restoration. Like, I unapologetically, that's my purpose as a religion professor at BYU, right? Sure. But with this particular class, it's we. I frame it more on, I want to, I want to uh, create understanding. And if there are lessons from the Book of Mormon that help you with your faith, then we can. You know that would be an an, an also an amazing benefit as well. Yeah. And so we, um, I just go through. I teach the text of the Book of Mormon. I teach the stories and the and the teachings of it. And then I'll often say, okay, from an evangelical perspective, how do you view that? Is that similar or different? And sometimes mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, that's really similar the way we think about it. And some say, no, that's different. I have Muslim students in there. I say, tell me what you would think. Yeah. I have people from all different kinds of of traditions in there. Yeah. And so we talk through it and we try to create understanding and hopefully it's a a general edifying experience that builds faith in God, uh, hopefully on some level to whatever tradition someone might belong to. Yeah. So being in that academic world and academia requires critical thinking, if there's one trope, if you will, or perception that was fed to me prior to me engaging with Latter-day Saints, it's Latter-day Saints are discouraged from critical thinking. Is that true as a professor at BYU? I, uh, Absolutely not. In fact, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but the head of our church has both a, a, an MD and a PhD. President Nelson is both a medical doctor and he has a PhD. Mm. The first counselor has a JD from the University of Chicago, and the second counselor has a DBA, a doctorate in business administration from Harvard. Mm. So education and critical thinking are extremely important in our mm-hmm. faith. Mm-hmm. Education is greatly emphasized. Yeah. Uh, now, Latter-day Saints are quick to say there are different tools at getting at truth, and I think traditional Christians would resonate with this deeply. Of course. There's revelation, and that's one way we get at truth, and for us, that's foundational. And then, you know, the scientific med- method or critical thinking, logic, or reason are absolutely real and important and vital ways of getting at truth, but we, we start from the assumptions of, mm-hmm. of revelation. 
and I, obviously you believe in revelation. It's just we have different sets of revelation, right? Right. You right. Know? So to that point, then, I'd be curious to know how you would handle this. I think I know please. you're going to answer yeah, it, but please. so <clears throat> I bring this this uh, example up quite frequently because it's something I recently learned and it's helpful for me. Yeah. So if I'm a uh, a Latter Day Saint student at BYU and I'm reading the New Testament and I find this passage where uh, Paul says it's better for a, a man not to marry, right? Yeah. I read a passage like that. And then we look at church doctrine that teaches that, you know, you can be sealed to your family forever. Right. And, you know, eternal marriage is, is, is available to those who would desire to, to move down that path. As a professor of religion, mm -hmm. as a professor who handles texts, how does a Latter-day Saint look at something like that? Because from an evangelical standpoint, the sola scriptura, this is right, a rallying right. point. Yeah. This is what we always do. If something seems out of square, out of plumb with the Bible, it's like, You've got to, you got to reconcile this. Right, right. So, yeah. how does a Latter Day Saint handle that type of um, approach? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, one approach is to is to look at the text, what the Bible is saying, First Corinthians seven, in your case, mm -hmm. right, and say, okay, what is what is the intent of the author? What are they trying to say here? And and uh, try to make sense of that within our own theology. Mm -hmm. So, someone might go to another place where Paul says, neither is the man without the woman in the Lord, or the woman without the man in the Lord. Yeah, right. right. Or they might frame 1 Corinthians 7 as, well, this is specifically about Paul and his particular station as a missionary or something. It's about the context, yeah. Right, or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I should say this, as Latter-day Saints, uh, because our, our not the Bible is not the only source of revelation, as a missionary, sometimes I would get caught into trying to defend my faith only through the Bible. Yeah. But I actually really believe that the Book of Mormon is an ancient record and Joseph Smith was a prophet. And so I take all of Revelation as a whole and then and try to make sense of certain passages within that context. Yeah. So maybe another way to put it is we have more scriptures. Yeah. Right? That's it. Yeah. And, what, and the reason why I'm asking that is yeah. because if I'm going to uh, my undergrad, which is a Christian school, or even a, getting my master's degree at an evangelical seminary where we're always rallying around the Bible, um, you're, as a religion professor dealing with ongoing revelation. You're dealing with ongoing revelation through the prophetic voice right. and also through additional scriptures. Right. Is that, do you find that to be challenging or helpful as you're helping students sort of maneuver through scriptural questions or concerns? Yeah, I find it uh, incredibly helpful and beautiful and, 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 and frankly, and like just, it really is exciting to me the idea that there's modern revelation in scripture and they work together to give us uh, a more complete view of truth and understanding. And so, I mean, obviously I would feel that way. That's the, one of the basic premises of the restoration, right? right? Uh, sometimes it, it can be unhealthy if someone wants to pit one against the other, but if we can find ways to see how does the prophetic voice and the scriptural voice work together to testify of Jesus and the work of the restoration, I find that that's just to be the most helpful way to try to work through that, you know? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I experienced in the Christian colleges and, and seminaries that I went to is sometimes the religion professors were almost regarded by students as like campus pastors in a sense, because they're always speaking from that scriptural vantage point, And there's a spiritual attuneness that exists for somebody who's teaching, articulating, educating out of the scriptures. Do you ever find students maybe gravitating towards you in that sense when it comes to just dealing with issues of faith, whether they're doubting or issues at home. It, how, how does that kind of play out when it comes to your relationship with students? Yeah, that's such, a, that's such a good question. I think, of course, students will come to me and ask me about questions of faith and scripture and theology. And it's, it's absolutely my responsibility to try to help them the best I can. Mm. But I can never speak as an authoritative voice, right? Mm. Um, I, I don't, I, as of my role as a BYU professor, I don't have any ecclesiastical authority, mm -hmm. right? And so I would try to push them to scripture and to words of living prophets. That's what I'm trying mm. to do as I try to help them work through those, you know, yeah. complicated issues. You know. One of the reasons why I'm excited to talk to you, aside from just what it's like to be in this academic institution, you know, teaching the way you are, is because I've made plenty of videos where I'm grappling with a certain aspect of Latter-day Saint belief and teaching, but it's a one-sided conversation. I'm doing some sort of presentation of what I'm observing, but I don't have someone to say, how do you handle this? Like, what do you do with this? So I'd like to just ask you a couple questions sure. and hear how you would answer this question from a student uh, who might have a similar question. Agree. Yeah. So one of the things that I struggle with when it comes to the Book of Mormon is the lack of evidence 
that I feel with the New Testament or even the Old Testament, we have sort of this plethora, if you will, of all of these different evidences, not just archaeological, but textual ed- evidences and even historical evidences and things of that nature. How do you handle, how do you answer challenges to a common thing that people will say that the Book of Mormon lacks evidence from a historicity standpoint or from a textual standpoint? How do you communicate that? How do you handle that whenever you're communicating that to students? So typically, uh, students will ask me very specific questions about the Book of Mormon. Okay. And not a general, where's the evidence? Okay. But I, uh, when I would teach, I, I used to teach seminary in, the, in, the, in our tradition, we have something called Institute, which is religious education for college students. And when I taught Institute, um, I taught a class called Foundations of the Restoration. And I did a whole um, a lecture just on evidences. And that's just the iceberg, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I divided it up into three categories of evidences for the historicity of the Book of Mormon. So mm. first is literary evidences. Second is archaeological evidences. And then third are the actual witnesses of the plates. Hmm. And so, and that opens up three, in my opinion, very large doors on evidences for the Book of Mormon. So for example, uh, with with literary evidences, you have chiasmus, right? Mm -hmm. Or parallelisms, right? Or parallel narratives. Yeah. Or in the Abinadi narrative, you have subtle allusions to uh, the Exodus narrative, right? And so I'll point to say, to me, this seems very beyond the realm of the Prophet Joseph, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. For archaeological evidences, I personally draw on the work of John Sorensen, who is a Mesoamerican scholar, mm. and see the correlations he f- he finds with the Book of Mormon. And, and, and so I find many of those compelling. Mm-hmm. I think that witnesses are extremely compelling to the, the history of the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. So that's typically the framework I work with is literary, archaeological, and then the witnesses. Okay. Okay, so then to that point, I think another thing that I'll hear a lot of people give criticisms of when it comes to the Book of Mormon, DNA evidences. How do you, how do you handle that when it comes to the individuals who are in America, what we would call Native Americans? Are they descendants of Lehi or not, and how the DNA backs it up? What is, I actually haven't heard much of an answer to that, not because I'm not saying it's not out there, but I just, I've not researched yeah. it. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm not a biologist, and I don't work a lot with DNA or or that kind of thing, obviously. And uh, tradition, it used to be that a lot of Latter Day Saints thought that all the people who were native to this part of the world were somehow Lamanites, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that seems pretty untenable, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, to mm-hmm. think that. And so I take the perspective that there were probably already people here when Lehi arrived, mm-hmm. and that and that a smaller group of people blended in with. Uh, people who are already here. And my understanding of the DNA evidences is, is that it's it would be pretty hard to trace Nephite DNA all the way back in a small group of people mm. 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And so, again, that's that's my understanding sure. of it. But. And I think one of the ways that that was cleared up for me a little bit, too, is you know, people talk about like there was a change in the introduction, right? Yeah. Where right. at one point it said they were the principled ancestors. Now it says they're among the ancestors. And I always thought that the intro was written by... Mormon. Mormon. Right, right. Um, but I come to find out... Or Moroni, yeah, yeah. That's not it. Right. It wasn't, wasn't Mormon, wasn't Moroni. Yeah. It was people... A church leader. It was, it was a modern yeah. church leader. Yeah. yeah. And uh, who obviously had good intentions and was probably just, you know, working with the best understanding he had there. There's actually a quote from a church leader that's about 100 years old. If I remember correctly, it's like from the 1920s mm. that suggests that there might have already been people here when the Nephites came, mm. you know. Another issue that I focused on before on the channel that's tied to Scripture, and since you teach New Testament, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. It's something that's even stated in the 13 Articles of Faith, and that is our ability to trust the Bible or to see the Bible as God's Word so far as it's been translated correctly. How do you understand the reliability of the translation of the New Testament and our ability to have confidence as we're reading it? Yeah, that's a really good question. From a Latter-day Saint perspective, uh, in the Book of Mormon and First Nephi, it does talk about things being taken out of the Bible, mm. right? And so I think overall the history of the Bible is extremely reliable. And I think probably historically speaking, uh, things being taken out of it probably happened very early on in Christian history. And so as like you- Like first century? Uh, you, probably second okay. or first or second, that kind of- mm-hmm. That I mean, the earliest manuscript we have is about 150, right? It's mm-hmm. about the size of a post- postage stamp from John, right? 
and we don't get start getting complete manuscripts. And there are some accusations of of people doing funny business with the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. And we know things like the Johannine comma in First John chapter five, like those are probably later editions and and other things. So, but overall, the Bible is one of the best attested books in the history of the world. Um, it's what's interesting is when when uh, Latter Day Saint missionaries go out and people quote the Revelation scripture often say, "Don't add or take away." Yeah, <laughs> it's um, I, I'm sure you've heard the Latter Day Saint response to that. But another way to think about that is um, John probably felt there was good reason that. From a Latter-day Saint perspective, he felt there was good reason to add that. Mm-hmm. And I've actually read traditional Christians who have argued that the reason why he needed felt the need to say that was because at that time period, there was uh, accusations of things happening with the manuscripts or changing the, mm-hmm. the doctrines or theology, that yeah. kind of thing. Right? Yeah, I do find it interesting when Christians will say, well, that's what it says at the end of the Bible, right? right. It's like, well, no, it's what it says at the end of Revelation. Right, right, exactly. And John was course, writing right. Revelation, okay? Yeah, it also says that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, right? And that's right. a whole lot of Bible you'd have to throw There's out. There's a lot of Bible <laughs> after that, yeah, that's yeah. good. So to that point, though, yeah. you know, even the book of Revelation shouldn't, you know, add or take away from it, like, even if we just kept that there. In the Joseph Smith translation, mm-hmm. he does make some adjustments, even right. to, let's just say, Revelation, right? Yeah. So how does a Latter-day Saint view... Joseph Smith's ability to not, maybe not honor or to not adhere to that call to not add or take away, even just to the book of Revelation. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's a really good question. So it's really important that we talk about what the source of truth is for Latter-day Saints. So um, ultimately, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from a Protestant Protestant perspective, it would be sola scriptura. Mm-hmm. It, the Bible is not the only source of truth, but it's the ultimate final measure of truth. That's right. right. Yeah. Right. It's, the, it's the authority that everything must come up yeah. under. Well, it's God's authority through what he's revealed. Right, yeah. right. And the way that uh, one of the leaders of our church, uh, President Oaks, said is the ultimate source for truth for us is is actually revelation itself. Hmm. And so that comes in the form of scripture. It comes also through prophetic statements, right? Personal res- revelation? So, and again, th- all of these, there'd be, a, there'd be a dynamic interaction with them. So this actually becomes very clear in early in church history that one's personal revelation could not supersede official prophetic statements or the or scripture mm-hmm. right yeah so when joseph gets a revelation to translate the the bible right and we believe that sometimes that's restoring the original text or sometimes it's prophetic commentary um he does that through revelation which is ultimately what latter day saints think is the ultimate source of truth is revelation whatever sure. form that might come yeah in, you, know. you know a lot of people will try to maneuver through all of that minutia all of the the ways in which latter day saint beliefs you know we, we look at it almost rigidly like this belief is different than that right. belief or it's the same as that belief what do we do with all this yeah. but if there's one thread that goes through all of it is that right there that you're talking about this concept, this idea, this belief in ongoing revelation, whereas we believe that inspired revelation as we know it, as we adhere to, ended at the apostolic age, that doesn't mean that God is not still revealing things, because He absolutely is. He reveals through uh, the Holy Spirit in our personal lives, through sermons, through, um, you know, different teachings or thinkers. Like, truth is truth, whether it's in the Bible or not. But we always just bring it back under the authority of, does it if it conflicts with the Bible, then we shouldn't trust it. Whereas Latter-day Saints believe that that apostolic age was not the end right. of God's inspired revelation, but as that continues, there is the ability for individuals, church leaders at any level, to look at where there might be seeming discrepancies to say, no, the Lord is just continuing to, to reveal things. And whether He's providing more clarity um, or would you would you agree that Latter-day Saints believe that that God can and does and will, if he feels he needs to, change a teaching on something, if it's more fitting for a certain group of people or a certain context? So, for example, like uh, talking about plural marriage or right, polygamy right. in the book of Jacob as being an abomination and yet it being reinstituted, that it's not quite as rigid in a Latter-day Saint context. There's a little bit more fluidity even in that ongoing revelatory voice. Yeah, what I would say is that Latter-day Saints believe in a like an absolute certain objective reality mm. or truth, right? And so and then um there might be times where God's revelation says this is what a people need to focus on, right? And we that there's obviously biblical precedence for that. Yeah. That's not that shouldn't be too foreign theologically speaking. And so that that's probably what they would say. And then also um section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants and 2 Nephi 31 
both kind of get at this idea that God speaks to us according to our understanding. And so one's capacity to understand and and see the clarity of a truth uh, may increase over time or we may get further revelation and light. And so, and that's that's kind of a mystery to us. I get sometimes worried when Latter-day Saints um, too quickly explain revelation in a sense. You know, mm-hmm. revelation is for us is the voice of God and we should seek to follow it. And yeah, we can understand the context for which it comes and, and all of that. But we, uh, you know, the way that God works through his servants, there's a little bit of, you know, I think we should approach that with humility and mystery. And I think traditional Christians can appreciate that too in the way he talks through Paul or, mm-hmm. you know, Isaiah or whoever yeah. as well. They're, yeah. I think it's it, at some point when we can, even if we don't agree, and this is a, a very um, dichotomous ask, mm-hmm. but where we can at least accept something, even if we don't agree with something, and when I'm saying that from an evangelical standpoint, we are going to have much more productive conversations with Latter-day Saints if we just accept the fact that you all believe in ongoing revelation. That is that is so incredibly important. Yeah, it's foundational. It's yeah. foundational <laughs> because when I think of a lot of Protestant ministries that are doing ministry to Latter-day Saints, it is this it is that it's coming to them with the Bible and being like, the Bible says this, and you guys are doing something differently. Right. And they think they've got like this mic drop moment, like, <laughs> ha ha, we just right. showed you why you're wrong. Right. Yeah. Whereas most Saturday saints go with a punch and they're like, okay, like we have other scriptures. Right. Like right. the ability for us on the evangelical side to just accept that makes for so much more of a productive conversation to get past those barriers that we get hung up on. It's like, well, but you don't believe what the Bible teaches there. It's right. like, but what do they believe, and why do they believe it, and what are they really apprehending and getting after? That's where we can have some really helpful dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like that's something that you're comfortable with, I mean, especially with a lot of the work that you do in an interfaith right. space. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and for me, um, it's essential to try to find ways that we, where we align, especially in core and uh, beliefs, and I have to do this a lot. I mean, I listen to a lot of sermons or read yeah. a lot of sermons from other and so I and I try to take that through the theology of my own my own personal theology, and I say, oh, do you know I wouldn't say it like that, or I'd word that differently, right. or, or whatever. But as a Christian, you know, I believe in the admonition of Paul. Uh, my job is to seek out whatever's you know honest, lovely, of good report, yeah. praiseworthy, that kind of that kind of thing. And so um, that's what I often will try to focus on. And I and I should say this: sometimes Latter Day Saints misunderstand that uh, Protestants. They do believe that God's spirit is at work and oh, yeah. moving them and speaking to them. Hundred percent. Right? And so and, where and we you know, differ is canonization. That's where we're right. right. You know what I mean. We're also very feeling. Mm. You know, that's another like gripe that people have about Latter Day Saints. Is like, oh, they're just told to like read, and if you feel something, that's what's true. Trust me, y'all. We are very feeling people. Okay. <laughs> right. Now we will then take that under the scriptures right, and make right. sure like if I'm feeling like I need to do something that's contrary to the scripture, then we shouldn't do it. Right. And I think Latter Day Saints would. Say the same thing. Sure. If you should not follow a revelation that goes against God's scripture, right? Right. But like, again, we have a bigger set, of course, of scripture, right? You going I mean? back to even, I know this is going to get super technical. So hopefully people don't turn this off. What we're really talking about there is like, what are we exegeting? Yeah. What are we really analyzing and dissecting and taking apart to understand its original meaning and how it applies to us? But this fluidity that exists within the Latter day Saint context, which drives evangelicals insane because we feel that there's this like, this objective foundational, you know, bedrock of mm. truth through the scriptures. I was having a conversation with a Latter-day Saint friend recently, and he was talking about the sermons preached at General Conference. And I was like, I, I've never heard a sermon at General Conference. I maybe have heard a little devotional, but I've never heard a sermon, because to me a sermon is taking God's revealed scripture, understanding its original meaning to its original audience, and then understanding sort of the truths that exist there and then how we can apply it to our lives. And a lot of general conference talks aren't talking about the scriptures. I'm not saying they're not referenced at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Latter-day Saints said, but we're talking about inspired doctrine. So we are teaching sermons. It's just that we have more than the scriptures, more than the Bible yeah. to exegete. Yeah. We can exegete doctrinal beliefs or positions. So in our sense... They are sermons because doing an exegetical analysis of a scripture verse is not the only way to present a sermon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, even within American 
you know, preaching circles, there are different ways of thinking about what a sermon is, right? right? And so more mainline Protestants will often use more of a narrative approach. Interestingly enough, that's kind of where a lot of my research lies and is what does a narrative sermon look like? Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, traditional evangelical Christians in America, a lot of them will use an expository sermon, which is uh, every main point comes straight from the right. text, yeah. right? Yeah. And I actually, that's kind of where I right, find what, myself from a preaching right, standpoint. Right. You never want to come up with a preconceived idea and then try to find support out of the Bible. Yeah. You do you go to a passage, what are the principles being taught, and then you apply it to real life. Right. And so for us, it's more dynamic, but uh, yes, the scripture is at the heart of what is revealed truth. Like, absolutely. Yeah. And there's this other element of living prophets who can speak with their own authority, right? Yeah. And so, and uh, we try to find ways to bring those two together and makes and use both of those sources of of truth, right? And this is what I appreciate about what you do, because where it's no secret that I disagree mm -hmm. with a lot of the truth claims more in the background of Latter-day Saint teaching as it pertains to, because if you don't, if you don't embrace Joseph Smith as a prophet, you got a problem, right? And yeah. not right. embracing Joseph Smith as a prophet, the, the, the premise of a lot of Latter-day Saint teaching just doesn't Isn't, have anything to stand on. Right. Agreed. Right? Agreed. But when it comes to the method, to the uh, approaches of handling and apprehending what has been revealed and what is true, there, there's just so much there where there can be such good dialogue. Right, I agree. And, and that's why I appreciate conversations like this. So often we stop at where we disagree and say, I don't have anything else to say to you because I disagree here. Right. And I'm not saying that those disagreements shouldn't matter. They should. And if I can get a little preachy, which I know I'm already doing, <laughs> this is why I always go back to the woman yeah. at the well, this Samaritan woman who had different doctrinal convictions than Jesus. And Jesus was pretty clear, like, I disagree with you. Yeah. Like, one day you're going to see that this is how it really is. But his, uh, his willingness to put the doctrinal dif disagreements aside is opened up the avenue of the meat of that story. The, the sweetness of that encounter was how personally he engaged that woman and how he was able to apprehend her deepest longings and what she was really going for, which was so far beyond physical water, but something more than that. That's why I think these conversations are so important, because we cut ourselves short when we stop at where we disagree, as opposed to saying, we do disagree. But we can set the disagreements aside for a second and connect on deeper levels, yeah. deeper desires, and deeper relationship. Right. Yeah, it's funny, because when I, I, I tell Latter-day Saints, I mean, because I engage with so much homiletics and that kind of thing, I'm like, a lot of what I hear, you would be totally okay with and yeah. even excited and deeply fulfilled by and, and feel the Lord working through the sermons of different people to help you answer questions. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so I would love to see a space where, one, uh, we're very open and honest about differences and then also find ways to, you know, where, uh, where do the heart's deepest longings, where do they find satisfaction and fulfillment in God and also are challenged, yeah. right? Because sometimes the heart is not the best measure for what's best for us, right? Yeah. And so the scripture doesn't just, you know, meet our needs. It also sometimes says your needs, the thing that you think you need is, yeah. you know, it needs to be challenged a right. little bit, right? You know. So there's this concept called holy envy. Mm -hmm. You spend a lot of time, not just in interfaith dialogue, but like you said, in this area of homiletics and yeah. preaching, and you listen to and process a lot of mainstream Christian thought. Mm -hmm. Is there any specific area of mainstream Christianity that's outside of the, the Latter-day Saint paradigm that you have some holy envy for, whether it be an approach to how we handle certain ways of thinking or ways that we practice or worship? Yeah. yeah. Interestingly enough, I just wrote an article... Um, on justification by faith, mm -hmm. trying to make sense of what it means in our tradition, uh, some preachers will frame obedience as a response to grace. Mm -hmm. We believe that in my tradition. Mm -hmm. We we teach that, right? We we think that that's absolutely true, but the repetition of the reason why um, a traditional Christian is obedient is because they're out of gratitude yeah. for redemption that has been offered to them through through the cross, right? Yeah. 
Um, we talk a lot about Jesus and a lot about his atonement. Yeah. But as the motivation for obedience, right. I really appreciate that from traditional Christians. Yeah, and that's, that's, that is really at the heart of not only something that's super important to me mm-hmm. in my faith walk with Jesus, we obey not in order to, we obey because. Mm-hmm. You know, we, it, it, is, it is a um, similar to like in a marriage, you know, I don't do nice things for my wife in order for her to love me. I do nice things for my wife because that love exists. And it's, right. it's a very different paradigm, right? right? And I feel most misunderstood there, I think, by mm. Latter-day Saints. In fact, I was having a conversation with a Latter-day Saint the other day, and they were saying, if you believe that you're saved just by God's grace and grace alone, what's your motivation to do good works? Yeah, yeah, that's a... And the answer to that is... <laughs> Because I love Jesus, right, and I right. don't want to disappoint my Savior. Right, right. I don't want to dishonor my Savior. I want to. I want to live a life that that not only honors Him, but also shows other people what a life transformed looks like. Right. And the individual is like, "But how do you know when you've done enough?" Because this is they were saying they they what they appreciate about the Latter Day Saint faith is. I know that as long as I'm paying my tithe and I'm going to the temple and I'm doing all the proxy work, I know that I'm doing enough to please the Savior. And I, I, I don't personally resonate with that, the way that that person said that. <laughs> sure. Okay. And, but I, maybe because what does resonate with you is something that resonates with us. And that is, you no, know, the, the Bible, Latter-day Saint or Protestant yeah. or Catholic, let's go there. <laughs> if reading the Bible sees that clearly that uh, obedience is not the, um, the thing that we do to earn God's love, but God loves us regardless and that he has graciously given us his savior, Jesus. And so for you to have a little holy envy there um, actually makes me feel seen, well, good. which I really appreciate that. Because like I said, I think that's one yeah. area where Latter-day Saints think that we just say a prayer and then we just go on living our lives as debaucherous as we did before. Right, yeah. and that's, you know, hopefully that's not a common misunderstanding. I don't, it might, I don't know, but I, I try to the best I can try to work against some of those misunderstandings because mm-hmm. that's clearly not true. But can, can we double click that for just a second? Yeah. And so I love the marriage analogy. What you might've said in response is, is just said, well, do you have a level of expectation for your marriage? And you're like, oh, I've done this. And so now I'm good. I don't, you know, right. right. But, but also to push back a little bit as well, mm-hmm. because I frame my relationship and justification with God within the context of a covenant, mm-hmm. It's really important for me. I can't say yes to uh, someone unless I can say no. Mm. And so the perseverance of the saints, the traditional Christian belief that once saved, always saved, from a Latter-day Saint perspective, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't speak for the church, right? Yeah. I should have said that earlier, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm an academic. I'll put, I'll put a little disclaimer <laughs> on an, the screen. I'm an academic, you yeah. know. Um, and uh, from my perspective, the fact that one can fall from grace is indicative of my willingness to stay in it and be yeah. faithful, right? Yeah. And so there uh that's a I think that would be a point of departure there. Yeah. Right. And so Well, it would be a point of departure with those from a reformed background. Okay. And you're and you don't you don't believe in the perseverance of the saints or do you? I do. Okay. Sort of. Interesting. See, this te- is what we this is te- what we can me. do. Yeah, te- <laughs> this is what we can do in the Protestant world. Is I I uh, joke with people, and I know we're getting super technical. And Latter Day Saints, probably don't even know what I'm referring to here, but I like to mess with people who are Reformed and say I'm a 2.5 point Calvinist. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you believe in Calvinism and predestination, you usually say I'm a five point like, Calvinist because yeah. Calvin came up with the five tenets. Uh, it's called tulip. If you want to look it up, what I believe is that once someone is truly born again they're going to live that way and they're going to be eternally secure. I think there are a lot of us that are in process. I think regeneration isn't always a moment. I think there are people who are looking to follow the Savior and and starting to adhere to certain beliefs, but they can forsake those ways. And I also believe that once someone forsakes those ways, it is very uncommon for them to come back and be born again. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I I think there's a, a... there's a very rigid sort of black and white view that's often communicated from a reform standpoint about perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved. And the reality is within broader Christendom, once saved, always saved is not, not the, yeah. it's not, not only is it not the norm, it, it, it upsets people mm. because there's also a strong belief that someone can choose to not follow the savior and yeah. to, to forsake him. And um, that there are those who think they are following him right. and the Lord's going to look at them and say, I never knew you. Okay. Right. So whatever you had going on, it wasn't a true regeneration. Um, 
which is why as a pastor, you know, it, it's, it's easy to teach reformed, but when you're in a, engaging with people, it's so much more about a spirit led. Here we go. We're feeling, yeah. um, allowing the spirit of God through revelation to help us engage in a discerning, not in an academic, but in a, a discerning dynamic where each individual is, right. where we see them before the Lord and how we can help them uh, draw closer to the yeah. Savior. So one way that, from a letter of saying perspective, one might understand covenant and justification is um, my works are a, a necessary part of faith. Mm -hmm. And so my faith is shown through works. And if someone turned away from God and sinned in such a way that they were breaking covenant, they weren't, you know, and that is not... The requirement is faithfulness mm -hmm. as manifested through works, not perfection. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so um, from my understanding, for a relationship to be authentic, I would have to be able to turn away from it. Mm. Right. Yeah. Just like in a marriage. If if someone says, you're staying married to me no matter what, even if you want out. Right. Like that to me doesn't seem like a, a relationship based in love and faith. Right. Yeah. And and, and, I, and from a traditional Christian perspective, I think. Well, you you tell me, you tell me. Well, I think that's. You should cut that last part where I started to explain your tradition. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's where I think there's also a misunderstanding that like all mainstream Christians believe in this Same whole, thing, right? whole idea of or or once saved, always saved. Right. When the reality is that is a very polarizing view, even within Christian denominations, and there are a lot of a lot of mainstream Christians and evangelicals who don't necessarily believe in right. once saved, always saved. Right. But that it is important to look at how many times in the epistles Paul, Peter, James, John tell the churches they need to persevere. You need to endure. Mm. You know, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, it's like you have got to keep your eyes fixed on the Savior. You've got to keep running. If it's if it's impossible to to stray away, why is there a call to persevere to endure? So that's another, I think, I don't know if you would call it a misnomer, but it's a misunderstanding yeah. that all of Christendom believes in this one. Right, it's mostly saved. form types, right? Yeah. yeah. And and thank you for for using uh, Scripture to sort of affirm a Latter-day Saint perspective. And I think I think Latter-day Saints could uh, learn from this idea that, look, if, if you have faith and repent, and from our perspective, have been baptized and received covenant— then you can have confidence that God has redeemed you and yeah. saved you. In fact, in the Book of Mormon, the word redeemed is used in the past tense over and over mm. and over again. It's done. It's, and so in some level, I've received that gift. Now, we do believe you can lose it, but sure. you've received it. So, for example, Alma the Younger comes out of his little spiritual coma, and he says, I am born again. I am snatched. It's a passive language, something that's been... He's received this gift. Uh, 2 Nephi 33 uh, Nephi says, I've been redeemed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, King Lamoni's wife, I have been redeemed, you know, past tense. And so it's a gift we believe we can receive and we have it, but through agency, uh, agency, you could turn away from yeah. it. Right. And I think one thing that I want to clarify from even our standpoint, one thing that we do blanketly reject, because unfortunately it has crept into Christianity, specifically in the 20th century, is such a moralizing of our faith that it is, well, if I sin and I die, I'm going to hell. But if I ask for forgiveness and then I die, then I'm going to heaven. And I'm talking on a micro level. Mm. Like I say a bad word and they get hit by a bus, even though I gave my heart to Jesus. <laughs> well, I said a bad word, so I'm going to hell. There's like a, an abuse of that that says like anytime you make a bad choice or you sin, you're you're hell bound. Right. But that, that's that's a... It, it just seems stressful to live like that. It's very stressful to live that way, which is why it's not true. Right. So we can have the confidence to know that when we're within the realm of God's right. grace, yes, yes. we're going to have positive steps towards obedience and drawing close to the Savior, and other times where we're not going to. Or we might even willingly choose things that we know are wrong. We all do it all the time. But Christ's grace is there to, to help us through His Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of our sealed hope, past tense, present tense, and future tense. If we're going to get into super yeah. technical terms, I don't know if you guys adhere to the, the concept of inaugurated eschatology, but it's the whole idea of a now and not yet reality right. of yeah. our faith. Yeah, I, I think there's absolutely some... That, elements of that. Yeah, that it has been done, it's being done, and it will, will be done. Be done right? That is yeah. our redemptive existence. I, I think we resonate with yeah. that a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If someone were to ask you, are you saved? I, I, um, I remember I was talking to a, a former BYU professor, and he actually quoted a traditional Christian preacher, and he said, I would say yes and no. Like, in some mm -hmm. sense, yes. Legally, mm -hmm. I'm declared justified. Yeah. For us, that justification comes through faith, repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, and enduring. Mm -hmm. And then, but on another level... 
that will happen in the eschaton later on. Sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's fullness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one last thing I want to touch on just as an important distinctive that I think also can point to what I see in the heart of a lot of Latter-day Saints when it comes to this idea, are, are we justified by faith or works? Mm. And that is where Latter-day Saints go to the temple and they do what they do. And from an Orthodox Christian standpoint, it's like, first of all, we don't need the temples. Second of all, like, what are you doing? Why do you feel like you need to do that? Right. And it, where it would appear that that is just a reinstituting of an Old Testament system where it's like, you have to do these things in order to remain on God's good side. Whereas I hear more Latter-day Saints talk about what we were referring to a minute ago, where it's like, no, I go to the temple, not in order to, but because of. This is my way to express my love for God and my adherence to the Savior. This is the way um, I can worship Him through making my covenants and my promises and some of these things, so yeah. keeping my covenants, keeping my promises. And from a, an evangelical standpoint, a Latter-day Saint might ask, so what are you guys doing? Right, you guys don't have temples. So, what is it? What is it that you're doing that testifies of the Savior, or, yeah. or that shows that that you have such a love for Him? If you're not going through these very clear, tangible ordinances, right? And the answer that I give to that is, well, we were created to be fully satisfied in God's presence, and when we were cast out of the garden. We are now constantly longing for that presence. It's Jesus that redeems us, that brings us back into that presence. So anytime I'm preaching a sermon on obedience, what does it look like to obey? Why should we obey? What does it look like for us to want to obey after we've been saved? It's acknowledging something that we think the Bible teaches very clearly, and that is when we all look in the mirror as broken, fallen beings, we know that something's wrong. Whenever we're going through life, we know that something's missing. And that thing that's wrong is we're separated from God's presence. The thing that's missing is God's all-fulfilling presence. This is what Jesus, God with us, came to sure. bring to us, right? Yeah, yeah. So anytime I preach a sermon on obedience, what I'm doing is reminding people how hollow and unfulfilling anything other than obedience is. Yeah. How, whether it's you know power, money, uh, greed, sex, uh, dishonesty, whatever it might be. The false idols of this world. The false right? yeah. idols of this world are even good things. And like Even good ones, yeah. Even, even focusing on things that might be good, certain hobbies, and none of it satisfies because we are most satisfied to take from an evangelical pastor, John Piper. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And that is like the existence that He's not only desired since the garden, but He's going to restore at the end of all things. So even though we don't have temples, there is a desire on our part to always be testifying that when we are surrendering our life to Christ and surrounding everything we do with who He is, that's our rightful place. And anything that we pursue outside of that is an, an out-of-Eden experience. He's yeah, trying to bring yeah, us back into Eden. Right. And the reason why I say all of that is because Latter-day Saints, I have heard oftentimes express a very similar sentiment. They're like, but this is why I go to the temple. This is why I do things, because this is my way to find fulfillment. This is where I find the presence of God. This is where I find, you know, communion with Him yeah. and some of those things. So again, another example of where there is a very different belief system and a very different practicing right. and applying of it, and yet we're trying to apprehend the same thing. Right, right. And I just think that that's incredibly important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think so too. And and for Latter-day Saints, I mean, if I were to ask them, uh, you know, how do you show your love for God? I think a lot of them would hopefully quickly say, well, I show love for others. And so mm -hmm. it's not that our love of God is first and foremost manifested through temple work or mm -hmm. something like that. And I'm mm -hmm. sure, but it, that is an element of showing love to God Yeah, and when we do vicarious work for other people. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. W one of the places that for Latter-day Saints, ordinances or, you know, these sacred rituals that we participate in are our way of choosing to have, uh, uh, to receive the grace of God in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And I could make authoritative arguments based on Scripture and Latter-day Saints Scripture for that, right? Sure. But I also think that there is a practical element to ordinances, ordinances and ritual and um a before and after. Mm. So for us, baptism is necessary. It is a necessary showing of our faith, yeah. right? And I think there's something beautiful and 
something that gets at the core of what it means to be human, to have to participate in a ritual. Before this, I was not a member of the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. and now I am. Yeah. And so for us, whether it's a baptism or the Lord's Supper sacrament or temple endowment, temple sealing, those are ways of in, inviting the power of God, the grace of God sure. into our lives. God wants to give that to us. And yeah. It's our way of saying, we would like to have that. Right. You know, with faith and humility and repentance, we... We would like that, which is a know? view that's shared in a lot of mainstream Christianity. Right, absolutely. Right? Catholics have a similar yeah. type view on, on, on some level. In fact, the well-known American evangelical view of baptism, which I adhere to, mm. is relatively small compared to the rest of Christian. And when it comes mm. to baptism, is not required for you to be saved. Right, it is not required for you to go to heaven. That um, it is an outward expression of an internal reality. And that salvation and being born again about it, and being born again by the Spirit of God doesn't require any sort of religious ritual. Um, I passionately believe that, but I also recognize that that is a minority view historically, and it, for and for all intents and purposes, even in the the, the global you, context, the global right? context yeah. of Christian doctrine, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. It's it's funny because sometimes Latter Day Saints think that they're engaging with all of Christianity. When typically, and throughout our history, we've engaged with American evangelicals, often from a Reformed, yes. right, Calvinist background, right? And, and that, again, is, I think I heard someone communicate one time that that Reformed, and I don't know how they got this number, is only like 13% wow. of the broader American evangelical church. So that's another reason why I'm hoping Hello Saints kind of... When people are like, why are you weird? Why are you different? I'm, I'm actually not. I just might be a little bit more of a, a representation that counterbalances what Latter-day Saints are used to engaging, because there's a lot of people like me. But um, I, I just think that it's important that we continue to press in toward each other where we have this, in, this instinct and this historic habit to lean away from one another. Right. Um, again, it's not to say that our differences don't matter. It's not to say that they're not fundamental or important. We need to acknowledge those, and sometimes we need to grapple with those. But when that's all we're doing, we miss out on all these other amazing, edifying types of conversations yeah. That, yeah. that we're having. No, I agree, and I, I didn't mean to cut you off at the end there, but I, I, I really appreciate it, Jeff, that you, I really get the sense from you that you're trying really hard to deeply understand us and stay true to your beliefs. And yeah. so I personally really appreciate that, you know, for someone to say, oh, this is, this is actually what Latter-day Saints think and believe and it's hard work. It's yeah, hard it's work, hard to, work. <laughs> to learn like the nuances of another tradition, and and, and hopefully you, Latter Day Saints can return the favor and try yeah. to uh, better understand broader traditional Christianity. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, it's it's been incredibly eye opening for me. It's been a fascinating journey, and I'm most excited about just the number of connections and friends that I'm making within the church that I otherwise wouldn't have had. Um, and you know, at, at the end of the day, I think it's just really important that. Anytime we engage with one another, and I do this with every Hello Saints video, the most important objective is that we just keep the conversation going. And I know that might seem sort of generic, but if you really think about it, in interfaith dialogue, we're always looking for the takedown. We're always looking for the mic drop. And anytime we successfully do that, the conversation's over. Right. You're probably never going to talk to that person again. If we are going to love the Lord God and love our neighbor as ourselves, we have to leave room for that conversation to be an ongoing yeah. relationship. So I appreciate your Thank you. time, your insight, um, your perspective. I very much appreciate you just sharing openly about what you believe and answering some of my questions. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I really appreciate it. It's been really fun. Yeah, it's what it's all about. If you like this video, please subscribe. You can also just hit the thumbs up. That's a good thing to do. You can also follow us if you're just listening on podcasting platforms and you can get more episodes. You can support me on Patreon if you'd like. You get some behind the scenes access to some of the things that go on here at Hello Saints, but you don't have to do any of that. Just keep coming back for more videos or keep listening to more podcasts. Thank you again Thank so you. much for joining me. And until next time, I'll see you later, Saints. Mm -hmm.